uh, with um, the internet connection. So the next guest is Dave McKean, and he's an illustrator, and he's going to show us his work and talk about a little bit about his work and to know him well. Uh, so please welcome Dave McKean. Okay, Dave, thank you. You're on. Dave, can you listen? Dave, can you listen? Me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, so um, I already introduced you. Um, okay. And it's showtime. Thank you once again for being here. And I'm we're okay, sorry about these issues. It's, you know, okay, nobody can understand sometimes these digital things. <laughs> So welcome, and please, um, the stage is yours. Thank you. OK. Yes. OK, you can start. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I, sorry. OK. Yes. okay, okay. I thought, sorry, I thought you were going to do an introduction of some sort. OK. OK, okay. well, uh, thank you. Thanks very much for inviting me to uh, talk. Um, I've just uh, uh, put a, a, a collection of images together um, just to have something to talk about. So I'm going to connect to those, uh, to that file uh, now. And um, if anybody has a question or two, remember it and we'll deal with it at the end. Okay. Hopefully that will come up on your screen. Nod if it's come up on your screen. It's good, fine. Okay. Um, so uh, first of all, um, it's been a weird year. Uh, I'm sure we've all dealt with it in our in our own ways. Um, for, I've been fortunate. I had a bunch of work, books, and various things set up. So I've just been working on those. But I have been photographing the bird family, and all of these little guys have found their way into the drawings that I've been making for books, uh, various projects. That's a reed warbler hammer. Uh, um, that's a little owl. Uh, and uh, so the projects that I've been doing, just this, uh, starting just with the stuff that I'm on at the moment, uh, illustrated edition of Neuromancer, William Gibson's seminal side novel. It's the inspiration for Blade Runner and uh, or the look of Blade Runner and uh, many other things, um, colour paintings and drawings. Um, as usual, trying to find ways of having the, the, uh, the images leak into the text a little bit. I don't like illustrated books, just have an image uh, apparently separated from the text a little bit. Um, and then at the moment, I'm working on uh, an illustrated edition of the Gui by Peek. Peek was an illustrator and illustrator, and um, it's a great big sprawling fantasy novel, uh, but it's also a, uh, a satire of uh, English life, the class system, politics. Um, and these are all pencil drawn and um, some tone added in the computer at the end. Uh, and they are all in some way quite claustrophobic. The characters tend to be surrounded by this uh, endless Byzantine uh, castle. Um, about halfway through last year, uh, I uh, started uh, uh, this project with a great Spanish artist called Jorge Gonzalez. Um, I've always fancied doing a conversational project, uh, something with, with, with no brief or no preconceptions, 
where I make a drawing and pass it on and then this little conversation going. And it's become a bit like a chess game. So at the moment it's called your, um, and I've talked to various people about doing this over the immediately got back to me first image. So we've been trading drawings one or two a week really uh, and slowly building up a book. As I say, no brief at all. Uh, no idea of what it's about. But characters and themes are starting to emerge as we work our way through it. And the birds keep on making an appearance. Um, and uh, what else? Uh, various odd little jobs have come in, over, which has been nice to uh, dip back into doing uh, the odd commercial brief. This is for the Lakes Comics Festival in England. Easily the best comics festival uh, around here. I highly recommend it. It's in the Midlands. Uh, it's a very friendly little place. I had a couple of exhibitions last year. And they've happened, they just got moved. And they did happen. I couldn't go to them, unfortunately. Um, but what I lost in not being able to be there in person, I gained by being able to do virtual walkthroughs of the shows and um, have people from all over the world come and uh, I could chat to them. So that's a good side of uh, the, um, the digital <laughs> revolution. Um, so this is one of the shows uh, that was in Brussels. In fact, it's still up. Um, it's uh, a, a 45 creating handmade posters and uh, prints based around the cinema that they particularly like. I love silent films, so mine are all um, and then this is also a sample project that I've been doing um, through the year. It's called Nitrate, drawings and paintings inspired by uh, various silent films, Napoleon. Um, and then some of the paintings and drawings have been in an exhibition in Tenerife. So that. And this is an ongoing project. So I've been doing this for about 10 years now, and I will finally get to the end of it. If not this year, then shortly into next year. Um, and it will end up being like 200 drawings. Uh, um, an American friend, poet, asked me to illustrate his book, and I like them. And so uh, I liked his poems. So I've been doing uh, illustrations for that. And I got into a routine of going out in the morning and photographing the birds, coming back, having a coffee, and doing a drawing. So this has fit nicely into that. Just spend an hour making a drawing, uh, either for my nitro project or poems. Last year, I also finished up a new uh, graphic novel called Raptor. Uh, it's just, I've just got copies, actually. Uh, so, and I think it's out in about a month, about a month's time. I, about... Uh, I wanted to write about what was going on in the world, uh, but not really directly. So it is about politics and political monsters, um, but seen through the lens of this sort of strange, uh, fantastical story. Two stories, uh, uh, parallel stories. Our world of a Welsh writer, Luke Sleekan, uh, whose wife has just died, and he's coming to terms with that and is sure that there's another world beyond our world. Um, and then that other world, the, the parallel story, features my main character, Raptor, as his name is, um, hunting down uh, large creatures, but uh, there's a sort of political, satirical uh, strain to that story. That's him. Um, I've been doing album covers. Uh, most of my musical friends have had a, a tough year, um, but Bill Lieb and Reese Fulber at Frontline Assembly have been recording like mad, so they've recorded three albums in the t in one year. So I've been doing the album that his album, their albums covers. This is uh, for the second for FLA album uh, of the year, Mechanical Soul. Just, uh, album of a side project that they do called Noise Unit. 
these are a combination of photo collage, painting, digital manipulation. Uh, uh, and then I've been doing a, a project with a, a, another friend, musician, multi-instrumentalist, Stian Carstensen. Uh, we've made a film, uh, sort of long distance direction. Uh, they sent me some shots of, uh, of Stian playing in the, in the uh, this extraordinary landscapes where he lives in Norway. And, um, and then I've been editing it together to create a narrative. So then I send back requests for shots to make the narrative work and they go out and shoot more things. I wish I could go to Norway myself and direct properly, but um, circumstances have not allowed that. Um, so it's been this strange, uh, again, conversational uh, way of uh, doing it, and it's been good. And I'm doing the album cover, by the single cover, uh, and I'm just filming it. Uh, this was a project called um, Artists Against the State. Uh, again, commission of lots of different artists making uh, prints. Uh, for uh, to rape endangered peoples around the world. These are the chap. Uh, magazine cover uh, for uh, strip kids. Circular logo. Uh, so uh, there was only really one thing on my mind last year. So this cover kind of made itself really. This is uh, Sisyphus trying to get the. Uh, the boulder of COVID uphill. Um, a book cover for a uh, writer, Brian Kathling, also a wonderful artist uh, called Monkey. And then this was the first exhibition that uh, I was due to go to last year, but it got moved back. Uh, but it did happen. Uh, Kafka's pencil illustrations for crime and punishment and, um, and uh, a book about Prague little travel book about Prague. Uh, so that all happened. I wish I could have loved to see the digital walk online. And then another friend of mine, uh, somebody of nearly 15 years now, Heston Blumenthal, a three Michelin star chef, uh, has a restaurant here called The Fat Duck. And of course, they've had a dreadful time as well. The whole hospitality uh, sector has been really uh, damaged uh, a lot by uh, this um, pandemic. They've survived um, and it was their 25th anniversary year of opening and they've had to sort of shuffle that back a year. But we've done the artwork and illustrations and new men that you had a sort of trail that you follow. Um, it's a, an extraordinary ex experience going to the restaurant. It's a bit like a cross between theatre and magic and memory and, uh, of course, extraordinary food. And the other thing that I've been doing is just tidying up, like most people, uh, <laughs> taking the opportunity to make sense of my studio, which has meant going through absolutely every single object and piece of paper uh, to uh, sort it all out. And so I, I can at least find everything now. And I found lots of things that I had lost including this tape of recordings I did with an American guitarist called Buckethead, who uh, very briefly joined Guns N' Roses and uh, was in Praxis. And it's an amazing guitarist. And we, uh, I was doing his album covers and he came over for a photo shoot and we booked a studio and did some recordings. So, um, and I recordings is that they were awful. They were great fun to make, but terrible to listen to. Uh, but actually, there's, there was lots of really nice bits in it. So I found, I've got the little bits, edited the little bits into five short pieces. And I'm now making um, a film, films based around, uh, oh, that's very loud. I'll turn it down. Um, based around uh, the pieces of music that I found. So the clips of footage come from a project called Wolf's Child, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and I've just been focusing on little moments in this narrative project that was both theater and film um, and creating this, uh, uh, these little abstracted uh, sort of 
sort of uh, ex expressive moment. Oops. Um, okay. So, um, back to images again. So, the thing I've been doing last year is putting together a huge retrospective book. Uh, I've been asked to do that by Dark Horse Books in America. And uh, it's meant really trawling through everything I've done. I'm trying to put at least a sample of everything that I've done, uh, which, is, which is about 30 years worth of work. So uh, it's quite a lot. And it started as a 250 page book and it's now uh, 600 pages in two volumes. Um, and uh, going through all of, going back through the drawings that I've been doing, back to the early comics, DC Comics, which was a Batman book called Arkham uh, through all of the covers that I did for Sandman and Hellblazer and other DC projects, uh, back through children's books that I've done. Uh, this is Coraline, written by Neil Gaiman. Um, and the album covers that I've done for all sorts of people, hundreds of them now, which is Fear Factory. Um, photographs uh, used for uh, book and comic and album covers, but also published uh, standalone monographs of my photographs. Back to early art school stuff. These, these were the few bits of art school uh, work from my portfolio that I could stand to see again. <laughs> so, uh, but I wanted to include them just to give people an idea of uh, what I was doing in art school and where my work came from and the, the collage uh, style that I was experimenting with a bit in art school. Um, so the, this is the first graphic novel that I did. Comics were my first love. Uh, so, and I just really wanted to do to art school, really just wanted to draw comics um, and spent the first year arguing with my teachers and they eventually won. And I looked out a bit and looked at the world uh, that was a lot bigger and broader than just comic books. Uh, so um, I had a wonderful time in art school and uh, it completely changed my view of what I wanted to do. And uh, I became a sponge really just taking in all of these uh, different influences, things that I was uh, seeing. But Violent Cases was the first book I did with Neil. And, and then that quickly uh, ran into doing uh, cover assignments for DC Comics, including all of the covers for the Sandman series uh, and books. Uh, and it's now being turned into a TV show. And spin-offs from that, this is The Dreaming. Uh, is another the uh, Sandman books, and then this is I'm st I'm still doing them. I can't seem to escape them. This is another another set of covers for the third uh, edition of Sandman. This was the uh, another graphic novel with Neil for Mr. Punch. Punch and Judy is a peculiarly English children's puppet show that uh, most English people have seen. And, dam and have been damaged by <laughs> it's, um, it. You, you usually find them on the beach uh, in the summer and uh, the, the, the man is left in charge of a baby uh, that he can't stop crying. So he kills, the wife comes back and he's not very happy about that, obviously. So uh, he kills his wife. And then the policeman comes to arrest him for murder and he kills the policeman. It's a relentless series of murders, um, a serial killer story, basically. Um, and there's lots of, there's a dog and there's some sausages and there's a ghost and a little puppet that keeps saying, that's the way to do it all the time. So it's very funny and all the kids are laughing and shouting and having a good time. There's almost always one kid at the back with a white face who, who sees it for what it is. Um, this appalling, brutal story. Um, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great way of showing you the difference of, that context makes when you see something as a child and then you see it again as an adult, it takes on a completely different meaning. So that's what the book's about. Really. Uh, this is my first book that I wrote called Kate. Um, it's about 
uh, creativity and um, where we believe in things and what we believe in. Um, and it's also, it was my chance uh, get back to the way real uh, and speak. Uh, comics you know, often drawn in a very and they speak in a very speak in a very particular way not a way that I think real people will pause all the time and start, start sentences and then forget what they were going to say and head off somewhere else and I love that conversational quality so I try to get that in the pages and I've con continue, uh, continued doing comics ever since I get sort of sidetracked occasionally doing other things but I, if I'm not doing a big book then I'm doing uh, short stories in all sorts of styles for all sorts of reasons. Um, and then I've illustrated lots of books. Uh, this is uh, a book of short stories by Stephen King. Uh, yes, uh, this is, um, I did a, a few things with uh, musician John Cale, who's in the Velvet Underground. I illustrated and designed his autobiography and then another book. And then I loved his voice, he's, he's Welsh but he's lived in New York for most of his adult life. So he has a strange accent, lilting, beautiful quality. So I got him to do the narration for a short film that I made. Um, this is the book with the evolutionary biologist, Richard Dawkins. Uh, I, I had read several times that Richard wanted to do a book, which as, a, as an introduction to science and critical thinking. Um, so I got my agent to contact his agent and uh, went to see him and actually he hadn't got very far with, with what he wanted to do exactly but he did have one really lovely idea which was to ask 12 questions and, uh, about the world uh, who was the first person what is an earthquake what, what is a miracle um, and then uh, answer each of those questions initially with the, the ways we've answered them in the past with, with, with folk stories and with myths and with theological stories and then the second half of each chapter would be our very best scientific explanation to answer those stories um, this is another book uh, with Neil uh, American Gods for the Folio Society um, I'm very happy working with Folio they have a long distinguished uh, life uh, creating these beautiful books um, so that, I'm doing Gormenghast at the moment for them. This is uh, Crime and Punishment, I mentioned for the exhibition in Brussels. This is the book itself. Um, uh, an, a, an amazing publisher in America called Beehive who started making these beautiful books. Um, every book is uh, a text that is over 100 years old. And so we have complete freedom, really. I don't have to get Dostoevsky's permission to do a particular illustration. I can just do what I like. Um, but there are many, there are 50, I think 55 drawings and uh, 10 paintings. It's a big, beautiful, oversized edition. Uh, it's, it's, uh, there have been many films of uh, crime and punishment. And some of them are great. The Russian, the recent Russian one is great, and the, the very old silent German one is wonderful. Um, but they never tackle the dreams uh, that are in the book. And the dreams really give you a, a key as to the mental state of the characters. So many of the paintings tackle the dreams. And then I'm, these are my little uh, sketchbooks. Uh, I did one at Prague, but this is at Venice. I sketch all the time when I'm away, and um, if it's they're based around one city that I've been publishing uh, as little art books. This is the Prague book. Um, this is the work that I've been doing with Heston Blumenthal in the past. This is the Fat Duck Cookbook and uh, book covers for various people. I'll, I'll get through this quick. I'm taking up a lot of time, so I'll get these through these a bit quicker. These magazine illustrations, uh, New Scientist. Um, I'm sorry, these are in a strange order. This is back to Heston Blumenthal again. This is a, a more recent book of historical recipes. And children's books. Uh, this is uh, Wolves in the Wars with Neil. 
And I've done a few books now with an, an amazing writer here in England called David Almond. This is The Savage. Um, David writes from a really, um, he's got very tough subjects. The Savage is about a boy who's, and uh, the anger inside him and uh, trying to deal with that. This is a book uh, with David called Mouse Bird Snake Wolf which is um, a strange story about overreaching creativity, I think. Uh, some children find themselves in a world with gaps in it. And so they, they all think up things to fill, fill in the gaps. And they do okay with a mouse and a bird, but the snake is difficult. But when they create the wolf, uh, they... Um, and then these are some more album covers. Uh, with John Cale again, Circus. Uh, I've done lots of uh, CD covers now for Bill Bruford, who's a, a, an extraordinary drummer. He was with the bands King Crimson and Yes, um, but he started his own band called Earthworks and I've done all the covers for them, including this box set uh, that we did last year. Uh, Counting Crows, Mar band um, and then this is a classical album uh, orchestral album uh, for my friend Matthew Sharp who have done and he uh, is, uh, concertinas for Hans Garth so that's the cover for that on assembly again I, uh, again that's a, a good 15 20 years worth of work and we are uh, planning to package them all into a standalone book, uh, sort of art book, uh, going back over their whole career. This is the cover and packaging for, from my own record label that I started with Ian. We, uh, we put out um, jazz mostly uh, to a very small audience, um, but I love making them. I love the music. Uh, this is uh, the first release called Food. With, and it came with postcards in a box. Uh, but also in the box, there was a twist of pasta or a bay leaf or a dried chili. Um, and we got a great review from somebody who said that they really loved the music. And also, if you buy 50 or 60 copies, you get a free meal for two out of it as well. These are uh, exhibitions. That ex is sort of low down on my list, really. I love books and I love making, making things that are democratically available to everybody, but it's nice occasionally to put on a show. And I have really enjoyed putting on these narrative exhibitions where uh, people come to the gallery and rather than it just being a collection of random pieces of work on the walls, there is a, a narrative running through it. And very quickly people get understand that and uh, go back to the beginning and follow the narrative through and really stay with the, sh with the show probably much longer than they would normally. And we've had some wonderful uh, emotional reactions to the, uh, to the stories. Uh, this is called the Coast Road that uh, took, took place around the, uh, the coastline where I live uh, and the little gallery uh, that I live near called Rye, Rye Gallery. The, uh, another show at Rye called The Blue Tree, um, that is actually a root ball turned upside down to create the tree that then grows off the roots extend out into the, the, the rooms of the gallery uh, and then out into the town uh, at, the, at about six o'clock in the morning on the day it was due to open I went out and planted these blue branches uh, all over the town so people woke up and these things were everywhere um, and they've so finally uh, I'm straight now um, I was on off. Uh, these are, this is a collection of all my short films that came out as a book package. Uh, these are my first films. The week before is a, about God creating everything in the universe. It's the week before he did everything in the universe. So it's the week when God shows up, up on Monday morning. Intention of doing that, but you can't think of anything really. Uh, so the film's about creativity. It's about staring at that blank piece of paper. Uh, Neon is a melancholy ghost story set in Venice. 
Uh, so both of those films went into festivals, and Neon in particular won some awards and was seen by Lisa Henson from the Jim Henson Company, and she was putting together a film. And so Neil Gaiman and I got together to do a quick pitch. We had a little window of opportunity to pitch an idea. We spent two weeks writing a script. Bizarrely, uh, only pictures said, great, here's a check, go away and make it. So we made this film called Mirror Mask, uh, which has live action at the beginning and the end, but then a great sort of strange, fantastical dream in the center uh, with our live action characters interacting with these CG creatures. We had a tiny, tiny budget, so we had to really play to the strengths of what we could achieve with that, with that budget. That's the actress Gina McKee is a huge floating head. Um, and then this is my second feature film called Luna, uh, which um, is very different, really. It's a it's a drama with uh, two couples in a little house in Devon over a long weekend. Um, one of the couples has lost a baby and. Uh, and so they are still in grief, really. And so over the weekend, a lot of old ang uh, anxieties and skeletons come out of the closet and it becomes very tense. But also the life of the child that died is lived out as a sequence of uh, dreams at different ages. So the first one is as a baby, then a child, then an older child, then a teenager eventually as an old man who dies. So this weekend is almost like the weekend when the grief ends and they, and they, not, well, the grief doesn't end, but they stop dwelling on it and only looking backwards. And for the first time this weekend, they start to look forward at the rest of their lives. There are strange little animated sequences like this. Um, and then, um, this is um, a chap called Bill Mitchell, who's had a huge effect on my um, working practice. Um, he ran a company called Wild Works. He very sadly died three years ago, uh, and I do miss him. Um, but we did, did uh, together one that's called The Gospel of Us, with Michael Sheen, um, which was a passion play, uh, a live three-day theatrical passion play that happened in Wales that I then shot as a feature film called Gospel of Us. It began at six o'clock on the morning on Good Friday with this 97 year old man singing a call to prayer that was witnessed by about five people and a dog and me and my camera. Um, shortly after that, Michael appeared on the beach and was baptized by this line of people that had mysteriously arrived in the sea uh, and that was witnessed by about 300 people. Oops. Uh, I put a few little bits of animation in on work. Um, <clears throat> and then it progresses through to the Last Supper at the Working Men's Club. Finally, with the crucifixion scene, uh, people in the streets with their cameras. It's a very strange atmosphere, seemed to be a they, they wanted to look through their little cameras and iPhones. And it was oppressive and strange. But by the time we got to dusk and he arrived at the crucifix, all the little cameras and iPhones had turned into candles or stars. And it, the whole scene became really beautiful. And this is the other, which was a, a theatre piece. Uh, our audience would arrive at seven in the evening and then we take them for a two mile walk through the woods and this strange fantastical story would happen around them. In making paintings and drawings based around the theme of the of the piece which was the animals and um, and, the, and the relationship specific specific relationship between mothers and their daughters um so eventually this will be a book of drawings and paintings and photographs and prints um, and then a, a disc of the, what I 
hope will be the finished film, which uh, is uh, which I shot um, as we as we took the play out uh, for about twenty of the performances. I went out and shot from different angles and caught footage. So I'm sort of sculpting a film based out uh, based around this footage. Um, and so we going back to that little uh, film that I read. Actors turning into stags and wolves and birds and crows. Uh, this is a seduction scene. And then the very last thing uh, is uh, this project called Black Dog, which uh, I'll finish with. Um, it was a commission by 1418 Now Foundation in England, uh, who have been commissioning uh, artworks uh, to uh, commemorate the First World War. Over a four-year period, they've commissioned 25 works across every media from many different artists each year. And they wanted to do a graphic novel, so they asked me to pitch, and I wanted to do something about one person going through the experience of the First World War. And I thought it would be should be a creative person, so it could be reflect. And Paul Nash, I think, is the strongest war artist we've ever produced. Uh, and um, you know, making a, all the dreams of Paul Nash. So it's a sequence of each one reflects a little bit about his past. This is his childhood, growing up with his brother, playing in the woods uh, of the trenches. There he found his voice as an artist. So I tried to find that. Follow that narrative. Um, this is his wedding that took place just before the war, uh, just as the war was uh, beginning. And on the day he got married, the first Zeppelin went across London. Um, and then I, as I was writing it, um, I was writing uh, some of the text in I'm assuming it, I could turn it into song. Part of the commission was to create a performance piece as well as a book, which could have just been me reading the book to an audience, but I wanted to make it a bit more than that. So I ended up turning the text into songs and writing a, an hour's orchestral music score and um, turning the book into projections. So we performed this in, at the Tate in London and at various places in Canada, around Europe, even in India, at festivals, book festivals, or art festivals. And um, I had done this once before. This is actually a project called Nine Lives that I performed at the Sydney Opera House, which was nine short stories with uh, uh, expressed in animation and film and song and music and narration. Uh, and I had such a great time doing it, I wanted to do that again. The Black Dog. How we appear on stage, I play the piano and do the narration. My wife, Claire, plays the violin and performs Paul Nash's wife's lines. And Matthew Sharp, who I mentioned previously for that album cover, is a world-class cellist and baritone singer. So he sings and performs some of the uh, narration, um, the, the acting uh, element as well. And that's it. That's it. Thanks very much for listening. If there's anybody left out there who you haven't gone to lunch already, uh, and if you have a question or two, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dave, for your presentation. Uh, we are still here. <laughs> um, I, don't oh, good. <laughs> I don't know if anyone has got any question for David. Dave, sorry, it's for Dave. Okay, um, one student is asking you uh, what, which is the technique that you most prefer to, to use? Or use more. Or use more. Or use more, she says. Uh, well, my, my usual answer to that really is uh, whichever one is most appropriate for the piece of work that I'm doing at the time. Um, and so, uh, you know, different books have different atmospheres to them, different emotions uh, that you deal with. 
uh, in the stories, um, even from scene to scene. And so really, I just try and find the, the, the way uh, of making images that best expresses those ideas and, and feelings. And that could be anything from the, the simplest of pencil drawings through to very elaborate digital composites. So it's whatever's best. And I, I think I would go a bit mad if I had to do the same thing all the time. So I like the, the differences. And so my favorite is always the, the next one I get to try and learn. <laughs> Uh, any question? Okay, uh, your inspirations. Can you, where do you get inspiration or what kind of things inspired you? Uh, anything. <laughs> anything and everything. Uh, I mean, travel is great. It's wonderful going to different places and seeing work by different people, seeing architecture, the landscape in different places. Um, it was wonderful. It was, well, challenging and wonderful going to India recently to perform Black Dog and getting that sensory overload of being in Mumbai. Um, and then it's, you know, almost, it, it's pretty much everything because even, even things that you end up, you know, not liking, uh, there's always something. There's something in everything, I think, to, to, to give you a, 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 an idea or a, a spark of something. Um, I love a lot of cinema. I particularly like very old cinema. Um, I, like, I like almost all music from the middle of the 1800s through to now. <laughs> uh, you know, examples of everything. So re it really is almost everything. I'm, I'm just a sponge. And then after a while of being a sponge and just taking everything in, I need to just not look at anything and just focus on what I'm doing and what my own voice is to try and digest it all and uh, work out how I can deal with it. Okay. Anyone? Any question? Okay, I actually have one for you. It's not this one. Okay. Uh, wow. It's not this one. It's not this one. Um, so, okay. um, you do a lot of covers and book covers and CD covers, and the typeface always that you use, you always try to put it, because you illustrate, because your illustrations are really rich. How do you deal with the illustration and the text when you de need to deal with them? I don't know if I if you understood my question. Uh, sure. Um, well, I. I I started designing my own covers mostly as damage limitation, really. Um, I did some book covers when I was fresh out of art school, uh, and I did not design the typography, uh, and they were so badly done. Um, I, uh, it, I, it was just very frustrating that the design was so bad uh, that from then on, uh, I was determined to sort of take control of that. And um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do the cover unless I got to do the type design. So if I'm, but if I'm working with a really good designer, if there's a really good designer who's who's commissioned it, um, then I'm happy for them to do it. I don't need to do it, but I, I try and uh, keep control of it when I can. And so, because the type is image as well, uh, it isn't two things. It isn't the image and the text. They're bound together. Uh, I'm sure you all know, uh, you know, the emotional quality that, that fonts have, that typefaces have, that hand-drawn that hand-drawn text has, uh, instead of, you know, uh, typeset text. They all have, uh, they're all full of meaning, and so it's important that the meaning is in sync with the image and also uh, what the content of the work is. So um, I like text and fonts that have an illustrative quality to them. Even if it's typeset, I usually try and run it through a process where it degrades it a bit and, and it, it feels handmade to a degree. I just happen to like that. Uh, it's not always appropriate, but I, I do try and do that quite often. Um, and then uh, for the comics that I do, I found one font um, that I just love. It, 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 it looks kind of hand-drawn but it's clean, it's clean and clear to read. 
it looks slightly old fashioned, but not cornerly old fashioned. It just seems to suit my mm -hmm. work and it suits the conversational nature of my scripts. I like people to speak in my comics the way real people speak. And I like it to have that humanness to it. And this font has all of that. So, um, yeah, I think that's uh, probably my only way I can answer that really. <laughs> okay, I don't know if anyone has got any question for you. No? Okay, they don't be shy. Yeah, I told you they were. Uh, <laughs> okay, Dave, once again, thank you very much for, okay. for your participation Pleasure. here in our plug and play. And I hope to see you in flesh. Um, when you're coming to Porto, let us know so we can meet and have a coffee or something. Okay. That'd be great. Yes. And uh, if you do this event again in the future, maybe I can come in person. Of course. There. We'll try to manage that, of course. Okay. okay. Thank you once again. Okay. And okay. it was a pleasure to, meet, to have you here. Okay. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, com mais ou menos decoração ao ditador. Uh, data de entrada da hora, avançamos para as três da tarde, então, está bem? Então vá, até já.